created and how it's destroyed. Okay, and frankly, you're going to need to understand how money is destroyed in order to know how it's created. Now, I've got a software background, so I think that way. So we all we all have gotten familiar with software. What's, what's, what is one of the key things about software when you look when you um, talk about it? What is it made of? Anybody? Code. Code. Algorithms. There's data and there's the algorithms. Okay. So, what is the algorithm for banking? Anybody know? Make it up. <laughs> it's really easy. Now I'm not going to talk about equity and cash reserves. I'm just going to talk about assets and liability from a banking perspective. This is their core algorithm. And this is how money is made. If you don't understand this, you won't understand banking. Okay? So, we have been taught that loans come from deposits. So a deposit, from the point of view of a bank, is a liability. So if there's $100 in deposits, you can make about, it's a little less than that, but let's just go with 100. You can make about $100 loans. That's what we've all been taught. It's completely wrong. The Bank of England, this past quarter, issued a quarterly report, and in it, it said it does not lend out its deposits. Okay, that's anathema. I mean, it's like, that's what we were all taught. So what does a Bank of England, or any bank for that matter, lend? Where does this come from? If it doesn't come from this, where does this come from? Make it up. Make it up. <laughs> Here's what happens. When you go into your bank and you want a $100 loan, they write it into their books. They just create it. Ex nihilo. They create it and sometimes that money goes into your account, in which case, the deposit is of $100. Sometimes it goes elsewhere, where it's given to you in cash. But the point is, they make it out of nothing. Money is just written into their books. That's how money is created. 97% of the money supply that's in our checking accounts comes from loans. It is just written, it's just created out of banks. Now, in this example I just gave you, if you got a $100 loan, and then you paid it back, what's on both sides of the equation, of the, of the balance sheet? Zero. So you just destroy the deposit, because you used it to pay back the loan, and the loan no longer exists. It's gone. Folks, it's just like free flyer mouse. You know, when you, when you check, when you uh, put, put back in, 20,000 to, let's say, United Airlines, and uh, they, they use that to give you a seat. They don't put the 20,000 miles into a vault with armed security. It's gone. It's canceled. It disappears. Same thing with money. So that's how money is created, and it disappears. We can get into more into this later on, but Jackie, or who's next? I think I know. Yeah, you want to talk about that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Does that mean frequent flyer miles or money? Yes. Yes. <laughs> 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 so, so, Ann Larson and I, um, OEM Canva, we're from Strike Debt in New York. And um, we're here to present to you um, just you know, our, our, our short background, some, some projects we've been working on, but really, most of all, we'd like to hear from you because there seems to be a lot of um, activity and interest um, here right in Baltimore and Maryland, so we really like to make time for that. Um, so I don't think we have internet, right? Oh. Is that correct? It's all a bit of cloud. I can use a hotspot. We also have um, copies of our newest book, it's the Debt Resistors Manual, and it's um, we've been giving them away, but also just to sustain um, the distribution. It's been on a sliding scale. Um, what you like, whatever you can pay from from nothing up to twenty. So um, we've got a bunch more downstairs. It's not works. It's a different password. It's a different network. You don't see it. That's the only one that's coming up. Oh. <clears throat> um, 
Would it be helpful if I was to give my presentation while you worked this technical oh, problem? Why? It's because I had to I had to appropriate the internet. Mm -hmm. and I it's okay. I'm just going to put my um, live stream. Mm -hmm. <coughs> while we're setting up, just to um, place you know, Strike Debt's work in context, as you just heard from um, the four speakers. Um, you know, in building a strong local economy and community, a key obstacle um, is to be found is this debt. And it's hurting a lot of um, people, and you know, people are our resources, and those are being, um, you know, really, really captured and, and held down by and so we think it's a key um, issue to look at. And we found that there's several potentials for, um, for action in that. Um, Too noisy if I have the door open. I just thought it'd be good to get air in here. Larson. Um, I got involved in strike debt because I had a lot of student debt myself. So when, uh, Occupy, uh, uh, when um, Occupy Wall Street started, I started going down to meetings. And I was also a, a teacher at the time, a college teacher, and I saw a lot of my students going deeply, deeply into debt, tens of thousands of dollars for college degrees. And on the other end, they often couldn't find a job to pay that back. And so I got really concerned about that. So I was a student debtor myself, but I also taught a lot of students who were in debt. And so that's kind of how I got involved. So debt is everywhere. Debt affects not just a small portion of us who have been profligate. It really affects more than 77% of the entire country. Um, more than half of all bankruptcies are due to a medical illness, things that were supposedly covered for by, you know, by health insurance, <coughs> but that's it's really it still leads to bankruptcy. And so student loan um, debt has Exploded um, in 2012, it passed the 1.2 trillion dollar mark. Mm -hmm. you've all heard. Um, and you know, 40% of indebted households use credit cards to pay for basic living expenses. I think that's the key. Um, this is not, you know, financing um, a luxurious lifestyle. If if we had, you know, is the economic crisis explained by all of us somehow doing that at the same time? It's unlikely. A lot of the work that we found um, supports that. So clearly, you know, sort of zooming in, um, yes, that affects all of us, but it really affects different groups differently, and that's very important to highlight, um, especially given the talk on, you know, on Baltimore this morning. African American families have lost over half of their collective wealth in the past five years. Um, and this was due to, this is a reflection of the unequal treatment um, received in the, during the mor mortgage crisis. So the subprime lending affected those communities more 
especially when we see that in the, lo the loss of funds as well. Um, low income families spend a disproportionate um, amount on financial services. So because banks are reluctant to, uh, most, most lenders are reluctant to lend to certain um, families, you, the, the, the people who are least able to afford these services end up paying more. The banks redlines, excuse the banks redlines are here in my mechanic. I, I moved to East Baltimore from New York, Professor David. They redline the area where my mechanic is. His insurance is higher, but insurance on the house is higher. So they do a lot of things in certain neighborhoods that not the young people, how they, whatever man they're doing with the redline neighborhood, you know, it affects things. These plans get out of the area. Right, absolutely. Redlining is a huge problem in there. You know, it, it, is there, it is illegal, but you know that doesn't stop. I mean, this is really an enforcement problem, and you know, diverging interests all the way. Um, oh, Yoon, can I ask you to speak up just a little bit louder? <laughs> um, and defaults on student debt um, are now occurring at about one million a year. A million student debtors are defaulting on their payments because they can't make them. There are no there are no jobs. Um, and let's just keep that in mind. Um, the, these defaulters, who who are they? Who are we? Okay, this is just a it's a visual from um, this was from Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon, and it shows a web of debt. Web is a useful analogy one because all of these different kinds of debt that we see as separate are in fact connected. Um, credit card debt, medical debt, student loans, mortgage. <coughs> All of these things are connected, and we really tried to highlight that. Why we are in debt. So, so did the, where this, how this all happened. Wages have remained stagnant for the past 30 years, even as productivity has shrunk. So again, who's capturing um, that, that, that value? Um, we see that there's a general you know, austerity um, movement when it comes to public services, cutting back, um, citing not enough, there's just not enough to go around, right? So then, what happens? Then? How are those needs provided? We turn to market solutions. Um, For-profit providers who give, provide you the service, um, not out of the kindness of their hearts or because that's what's necessary, but because they see value in your future. They want a claim on that because, again, people are, are resources and that's really that's really what we offer. And so you're mortgaging your future to provide for your basic needs. <coughs> There's something very wrong with that future. Okay, so this is, you know, graphs can be a little off-putting, but I, we, we thought this was useful because um, an economist, uh, Thomas Piketty, he just basically showed that um, capitalism has an innate tendency towards inequality. And what's interesting here is that this is the period from the like, turn of the century, so early half of the 20th century. You see that the blue forces, which you can kind of see as an extract, those are the extractive profiting um, forces, and then the red is what creates, that's the growth rate of world output. So that's, you know, those are the value generators. During this sweet spot, um, the interests looked like they were aligned. Um, that was kind of a post-war um, boom. The middle class grew and the jobs. So for a while, it was um, the interest were aligned, but we see that that is really drastically um, So just to give you a picture. So um, we'd like to give props to Maryland for leading the way on progressive uh, debt legislation and court decisions. Um, in 2012, um, a court develop new rules um, that would make it harder for debt collectors to show that they actually had a claim on the debt that you owe. Before, there was just this trend of what's called sewer service. Um, there would just, there would be lots of mistakes made about you know, what you actually owe. Some people ended up you know, being sued for debts that they didn't actually owe and then got a default judgment. It's, it's a very, um, it's a very skewed, Field. And we think Maryland has been. Well, New York didn't even have to change this last time. And um, as you may already know, Baltimore was the lead plaintiff in the LIBOR uh, lawsuit, which uh, alleged that many, many large.
large banks rigged the, the, the LIBOR, which is the standard interest rate um, benchmark. The, 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 the lawsuit, you know, ultimately was dismissed, but we think it's an incredibly important, you know, example of how Baltimore has stood up and how other cities, actually other cities, have been looking at their finances to see if they were taking advantage of. So that's a very good development. Let's go into um, an example, right? The, the key example, lots of folks are talking about student, student debt. We, I mean, it affects not just students now, but obviously um, even more so after we graduate. So it cuts across a lot of people. As we said, it's over a trillion dollars right now, outstanding. Tuition keeps increasing um, due to the you know, divestment, the state disinvestment from higher education. <coughs> so now students are left to pay their own, pay their own way. It's confusing. So the person who is taking on the loans, you know, the student who's probably like 18 years old or whatever, and their parents guarantee um, oh, yes. It's a very confusing process. So there's a lot of, um, you know, there, there are a lot of deceptive practices going on. There's, even if it's not, you know, illegal, um, just by its nature, it's a, it's a very, it's a not, it's not a fair process. Um, there's no, there are no bankruptcy protections for default, uh, if, if you want your loans your education loans um, wiped out in bankruptcy, uh, unlike all other sorts of debt. And actually, this is an interesting fact, is that about one in six student debtors is already in default. So there's this, there's this debt outstanding. Some of us are not able to pay, but this fact is not known. I mean, this is something we go through in either way um, to ourselves. But that it's not a thing we do. Very quickly, this is a lot of numbers, but we, we did some calculations and found that with a slight shifting of priorities and how um, our national dollars are spent, tuition could be gone tomorrow. Right now, there is this giant, you know, bloated structure of tax of, of subsidies, government subsidies, that subsidize something that need not be, you know, it could be free to begin with. Um, we won't go through the numbers here, but you can find the math on our, our website, actually. Check that out on the network, do the math. And I'll just take a moment to tell you a little bit about you know, what, what we've done along the way um, in getting to these conclusions. We started out very, just gathering people, um, getting people to talk to each other, holding debt assemblies, basically like a support group. For, for people who want any sort of debt that they, they wanted to share, hardships. Um, There's you know people, young couples who told their stories about how they had too much debt, and so that that was keeping them from, from having a child and beginning their life. Um, and get a house. All, all of these very personal stories, and that really made us realize that collective action was necessary. So once we once we meet people visible to each other, and then the question was, what, what next? What can we do together? One effort was the Rolling Jubilee, um, which is a, a, a mutual aid project. Um, it, it bought up, so here's a quick setup. Um, debts, once they go into default, um, they are sold. So the same, the original lender doesn't rarely hold on loan that they, that they issued, they sell it, it's just like any other commodity. And so the debt is sort of downgraded and it trades for cheap. And so we wanted to get our hands on that, and we did. We um, bought up, <laughs> here we go, we bought up medical debt across the country because we thought that was really an original debt that people should not have to, to bear. And so we bought the debt belonging to 19, oh, over, over almost 2,000 people. Um, the average of amount we canceled for each person was 6,000. The point was we, we got it on at two cents on the dollar. That's how cheap it is. So 
what seems so insurmountable and just a, a mountain of debt <coughs> to the lender from the, from their side, it's just they're playing with chips. I mean, it just really it, it made you realize how um, again the, the sort of made up nature of things. Um, it, it, it changed the conversation nationally. I mean, they're really broad. We also looked at for-profit healthcare um, and how. You know, this is medical debt has its roots in the privatized, um, you know, healthcare environment. So we have a report uh, also on our site if you want to find out more. And we also looked, you know, in, in New York, um, several folks looked at Sandy and how FEMA was going to give aid to folks who lost their homes, but turns out those were just loans because our government too is more beginning to act more like a lender than a uh, sort of traditional um, banking mechanism. That is what we found. Um, so I'm just going to talk for five more minutes about the drones to tell you what we have here and then give you a sense of what we have coming up and then I'll shut up and we can all talk together. So um, when we started meeting and uh, talking about debt, we knew that we wanted to put all the research that we were doing and everything we were learning together in a single um, accessible format for people. So we created the Debt Resistors Operations Manual. This is the first version. It was just like a pamphlet version that came out in 2012. We've since um, compiled it into a book published by Common Notions. They're, they're here today at the conference. You can pick one up for free, or you can give us a small donation if you'd like, and we use that to print more copies. But there are, um, give you a sense of what's in this manual, kind of our take on debt. Debt is a profoundly effective form of social control, and it has become a primary form of extracting and accumulating wealth for the rich. Debt is not something that exists outside of us, but rather something that is central in forming our identities, characters, and our relationships. <coughs> to our, and this is kind of one of our, it's a statement of our values. To our friends, families, and communities, we owe you everything. To the financial establishment of the world, we have one thing to say, we owe you nothing. And these are some of the chapters and the different kinds of debt. And what, the, what we tried to do here is give people some individual advice for how to fight debt. How, what to do when the debt collector calls you, how to get out of paying this debt, but also in a lot of the chapters we tried to look toward the future. Uh, how can we organize collectively? What are some ways that we can um, create a new economy that isn't financed by debt, so that our basic needs are not debt financed? Uh, and another one of our sort of slogans is, you are not alone, and that we're gonna, we're gonna work on this together. <laughs> um, this is another, some, some of our animating uh, thinking. Uh, if you owe the bank $100, that's your problem. If you owe the bank $100 million, that's the bank's problem. So we think it's time to make debt the bank's problem, not our problem. Collectively, we owe the bank hundreds of billions. So what does collective action look like? This is at one of our debt assemblies in Oakland, California. And this is a debt boulder, like a pinata. And this is a gentleman who is smashing the debt boulder. Um, out of anger at the debt that he owes. So it's kind of a vision of a collective action. Um, one of the things we're thinking about doing is, what does organized refusal look like? The Rolling Jubilee canceled individual people's debts, and that was great, but we need to work on something that's more collective. How can we bring debtors together, find the connections? What about forming regional and national debtors organizations so that people can find each other in local <coughs> communities? People don't want to talk about debt. It's a shameful thing, and we're trying to sort of turn that around. The technology to make these connections already exists for evil. There are sites on the internet. The most popular is called readyforzero.com, and you can check it out. But readyforzero.com asks you to do is uh, give them information about all your debts. And they remind you to pay them, and they tell you how much you should pay if you want to stay, uh, so if you want to stay in good graces with the lenders. But what we're thinking of doing, and what, what kind of one of our current projects, is creating a similar online portal where people would share information about their debt, but we would use it for debt refusal. And we would encourage people to form in unions, to form collectives, to form groups, people who've already defaulted, who are going to default, to support each other through the default process. So our value is a collective refusal, collective, um, collective default uh, in a planned way and not let's just all pay. Um, so these are again, I won't go through all these, but so debt is a weapon. For sure, but it's also, we believe, a site of leverage, a site of resistance, a way that we have power against the banks and we should use it. With collective action, we can turn these bonds into leverage. Um, we also need mutual aid networks that hopefully we can talk about today. I know you folks in Baltimore have a lot to teach us. People like 7 million student debtors already in default. How can we support these folks? What kinds of networks and cooperatives 
Um, can, in New York, there's a law that an employer can check your credit before giving you a job. We do that all over from the job. It's right. They go by your zip code also. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So we're in a situation where you don't pay your debt and you can't get a job to pay your debt. This is the kind of like weird, twisted reality. Um, I'll just end with a quote. Um, Andrew Ross is a guy who works with us in Stripe Debt, and he wrote a book called Creditocracy about this new class of lenders who is just sucking up community's wealth. And he wrote, when a government cannot protect its people from the harms inflicted by rent extractors, and when debt burdens become an existential threat to a free citizenry, then the refusal to pay back is a defensible act of civil disobedience. For those aiming to reinvent democracy, this may be nothing short of responsibility. So thanks, everybody. <laughs>
And it's so difficult for us to get our minds around money because we're like fish that swim in water. If you ask a fish to describe the water in which it was born in, swims in, and will ultimately die in, they can't. So same thing for us with money. We transact many, many hundreds of times a day, dozens, a hundred times a day, and we cannot really have enough distance from it to actually differentiate it and actually define it. So what I'm telling you, money is not a thing, it is an agreement. And with an agreement, it means there can be all types of different types of agreements. And in the space of what we're going to call complementary currencies, they bridge what I would call the unused resources and the unmet needs. So if we can imagine that the river is the normal economy, which the strike debt uh, colleagues are looking at, that's the conventional money system, we have a whole pile of unused resources and a number of unmet needs in every uh, community. And what we need are other types, other monetary agreements to actually link these two. So <clears throat> you're already using them, and you probably don't know about it. Uh, most of you have gotten airplanes that have flown around uh, the country, around the world, and you've used frequent flyer miles. And that started off as a, basically, a gimmick by, you know, uh, it wasn't United, it was American Airlines, about 40 or 50 years ago, in order to breed customer loyalty, to get you to fly that particular airline. And lo and behold, <clears throat> it actually became like a currency, because when you, uh, gathered a sufficient number of these frequent flying miles, you could then buy another seat <coughs> using these miles to go to Cancun for vacations or whatever you wanted to do. So this is an example of a commercial complementary currency. It links um, unused resource, which is an empty seat in, in an airplane, with an unmet need, and in this case, it's the airline wanting you to be loyal to them. So how come this is possible? And we're, <coughs> excuse me, we're at an extraordinary convergence of time where we're becoming more and more aware that there's other <coughs> possibilities available to us in our changing in consciousness, if you will. Also, there is now cheap com uh, computing. If airlines had to get, you know, dro droves and droves and droves of clerks, you know, adding up all these frequent flying miles, it would never work. Because we have cheap computing, it is now possible to process trillions and trillions of miles that are flown every single year. So we're having an interesting convergence of technology and an awakening to that there are other possibilities. Um, I'm going to talk about social purpose complementary currencies. And I want you to take a look <coughs> at this. We're back to Brazil again, but another part of Brazil. We're in a town of Curitiba, Brazil, which is in the south. And here you see this very beautiful park with um, <clears throat> this gorgeous um, botanical gardens inside. And what is really spectacular about this is that that's the site on which this was all built. It was a garbage dump. And this was a problem that the town of Curitiba, Brazil had because people came from the uh, hinterland to the town in order to find work, and they set up these favelas, which are chant shanty towns. And the margins in between the various houses were so tiny that the regular trucks could not get in to collect the garbage. So the mayor of Curitiba at that time was Jaime Lerner, and basically he had no money to clean up the town. There was absolutely no way of going to the central government saying, hey, I need a loan to, uh, to, to clean up my town. There was no money to be gotten. So he then realized, ha, huh, there is a workforce, and we've got garbage. Let's see what we can do. So he realized that he had a municipal bus service that was running half empty, that was going around the town of Curitiba. This is an updated version of it now, not one from 20 years ago. But as you can see, um, when anybody goes to use the, uh, the bus service, they have a coin. Eight, <coughs> six to eight doors open so they can get in and out very, very quickly. It's highly efficient. You see the people coming off the buses. So what he decided to do is he put out a 
notice to everybody living in the favelas, for every kilo, every bag of garbage that was sorted between um, glass, uh, cans and paper, and other biodegradables, and if these were put into vats in different colors corresponding to the type of garbage that was collected, they would receive a token to ride in the bus. Lo and behold, in a matter of weeks, the favelas of Curitiba were picked clean. And uh, mostly a lot of kids and older people uh, now had these tokens in their hands, started using them on the bus services, and then the local farmers realized, good heavens, um, we're happy to exchange our fruits and vegetables in turn for these chits. The government then went on to initiate other so, uh, social benefit programs uh, for every child that stays in school and that you can show that they've had a good attendance uh, at school, the family gets a box each month that is filled with the staples such as oil, rice, and other goodies that uh, the family will need as their staples. This, this idea of cleaning up, the simple idea of this cleaning up uh, the neighborhood, then transferred to the fishermen. On days when they would go out into the bay by Curitiba and there were no fish, they would actually trawl for garbage. And these are fishermen coming in to port with bags and bags of guck that is actually at the bottom of the bay. And when they turned those in, again recycled, they received tokens which they could then use for a variety of things in the town of Curitiba. And uh, the mayor put into practice um, a number of different programs that now makes Curitiba with something like 11 parks of this type as one of the most ecologically advanced cities in the world. They were given that prize by the United Nations about 10 years ago simply by saying that garbage is not garbage, garbage is money. So basically they had a currency that was backed by garbage. Um, we dealt last night in, in very, very moving ways about marginalized communities. And um, we have in all towns, all different types of marginalized communities. I'm going to talk to you about one in Belgium, in Ghent. Uh, which is in the province of Flanders, um, that's in north um, west uh, Europe. And their problem is that there's this wonderful historical uh, town but has a huge problem with um, a marginalized community which is predominantly Turkish. And there are about 20 different languages spoken by a number of migrant uh, people that have come in from different parts of Europe and from Africa. And how to deal with this um, ostracized and, um, how do I say, troubled uh, neighborhood. So they did a survey and went around to this particular neighborhood and said, what do you want? What would you like to see happen in your neighborhood? And they said, we would love to have a little garden. We come from the countryside. I would love to be able to take my kids out, show them how to plant, how to grow some vegetables, you know, it'd be a lovely thing to do on a Sunday afternoon, and also, you know, there's a practical application to that. So what the town decided to do was they leveled what was once an old building, it was an old factory, and they arranged small plots of land, I would say something like about uh, 20 feet by about 6 feet. And the people of the community could rent these plots of land, not using the national currency, which is the euro, but rather using this new currency, which is called turkas, which um, basically means uh, towers, which is what the, what the town is known for. And as you can see, they had different type of paper currency. And the reason why they wanted the paper currency rather than electronic currency was a lot of the people in these neighborhoods were illegals, and they didn't want any kind of tracking. So they actually to have paper currency made people feel a lot more secure. So as you can see, the local artists drew, um, uh, drew from the influence of the local neighborhood. So you can see the houses and all these sort of local uh, highlights. 
And not only could you earn, um, how, so the big question was, how can I possibly earn Turkas? So there was a variety of ways that the cities realized that they needed people to clean up their neighborhood. And by cleaning up their neighborhood, they would actually earn Turkas. And depending on the job, they'd be paid uh, a certain amount of Turkas. Here we have people obviously cleaning up debris. Uh, here we have people beautifying their neighborhood by planting. If you put a sticker on your door saying no trash, um, no um, junk mail, you know, you would get a uh, certain amount of turkas for that. If you put a window box in with flowers, you get a certain number of, of uh, turkas for that. So basically, for the first time in Ghent, um, the, the response to this was so totally overwhelming. They had more volunteers than they could possibly use. And it became so popular that other neighborhoods in this town of Ghent, wealthier na uh, neighbors, wanted to have their own currency because not only they not necessarily needed it for jobs that need to be done, but they just saw the community coming together in a fantastic way where neighbors were talking to neighbors and the sense of community that was fostered by having such a common program. What is also interesting is because it was a local currency, it stayed within the community. And if they had paid them in euros, or they, if we had a similar situation here in dollars, those national currency units would be gone in a matter of a day. Because it was a local currency, it stayed in the locality because it could only be spent in the locality. So for the same euro budget, which I believe uh, for the first year was something like 50,000 euros the municipality put up, they were able to circulate that money up to 20 times. Can you imagine the amount of work that has been done uh, as a result of that? And the people asked for it. This is what the people wanted. And one of the great criticisms I have, uh, people get very excited with the idea of a local currency or a complementary currency. And you know they sit at their desk and they dream of this fabulous idea, and then they go out and sell it. That is a push. What I'm suggesting, if any of you who are inspired to create your own community within uh, your own community currency within your own locale, is to go out and find what people want. What do your neighbors really want? What are the real problems? And in that dialogue, you can start assessing what your unused resources are and what your unmet needs are, and can design a currency that can suit that. And there's all kinds of fabulous uh, conversations we can have about currency design. And I'm not talking about pretty pictures on, on notes. We're talking about the DNA of the currency. Does it bear interest? Does it bear a negative interest? Something called a demurrage charge, which we can talk about at another time. You know, there's all this, you know, do you back the currency by time? Do you back it, back it by a local commodity? Um, there's a design of a currency. I'm delighted to be helping with in uh, Zimbabwe, Rhodesia. There's uh, the Savory Institute. I don't know if you, any, any of you have seen Alan Savory's TED Talks, but he's talking about reintroducing cattle in a way that's holistic, that can replenish the soil. And as most farmers in um, Zimbabwe are absolutely dirt poor, most people are because the Zimbabwe uh, currency is absolutely hopeless, they're actually creating a currency that is actually backed by meat, by the meat of the slaughtered cattle. So, I mean, there is no end to the possibilities of what you can create once you've made an assessment of what the unused resources and unmet needs are. Um, very quickly, um, healthcare is a huge issue uh, globally. And in Ireland, um, they are working on a project called Wellness Token. These are lovely little Irish kids playing an ancient Irish game called Hurling, which you've ever heard that, ever seen that played. It is frightening beyond belief in terms of its speed and um, uh, how the game is played. But anyway, the idea is um, that a lot of our diseases and our illnesses can be addressed by modification in our diets and by exercising. And they're working on a program to issue what we call a wellness token for the children in Irish schools, whereby they can earn tokens that can be turned in for gym shoes, for sports gear, for pop concerts, 
um, by um, adhering to a program of increased uh, wellness due to changes in their dietary behaviors and indeed uh, more exercise. This is a pilot project, but countries are now facing crucial problems, such as how do you provide health care? And in this case of Ireland, they actually have to cut back their health care. There was universal health care because they just can't afford it. So this is an interesting way of how a government can help to uh, address issues such as an important one as wellness. Um, <coughs> Furia Kipu means caring for chip tickets. And this is another example of a currency that is actually backed by time. So I go across the road to my neighbor to um, an older person who's having trouble seeing and driving. So I might drive her to a, a doctor's appointment. Uh, I might help her write a letter to her insurance company. Uh, I might help her with some jobs around the house. And for every hour that I spend helping her, I receive a token, which is electronic, and it's, it's called Furia Kipu. And what is interesting about Furia Kipu is that whatever credits I earn, I can transfer, transfer to my mom on the other side of the country or in another state. And somebody from her neighborhood can come in and look after her. This has been, in, um, this has been going on for almost 20 years in Japan. Uh, there are about 478 systems already operational, and they have two national electronic clearing houses. What is really interesting about this is clearly if somebody gets sick and they need to go to hospital uh, to have an operation or need kidney dialysis, they go, uh, they go to the regular medical uh, establishment. Here, however, the day-to-day -day needs of people are looked after. And when they spoke to uh, the surveys of the elderly here in Japan and asked them <clears throat> what do they think of these neighbors coming in, usually younger uh, kids coming in to help, they said they absolutely loved it because they spent time with people in their own neighborhood, relationships developed, they were asked questions about their lives, and they felt valued, they did not feel isolated. And again, the younger people earning these Furia Kipo credits, they could transfer them, as I said, or keep them until they were old and decrepit. How are we doing for time? Oh, goodness. Because I can keep talking. <laughs> Um, a, version of this, yeah. a version of this in, um, here in the United States is time banking. Time banking is probably the oldest and most ubiquitous form of a complementary currency we have in America. There is one new time bank being uh, developed every single week here in the United States. It was uh, first designed by Dr. Edgar Kahn, who lives up the road from us here in Baltimore in Washington, in Washington D.C. And um, time banking um, obviously, my, everybody's time is equal, and for every job that I do, it could be teaching English to immigrants, it could be you know, cleaning up a, um, a neighborhood, it could be getting uh, veterans, they have programs for veterans, reintroducing veterans back into their community and giving them work, and time banks are looking to pay veterans in, in uh, time dollars. Again, these time dollars are not convertible into national currency. They say for accounting reasons it's equal to 10 bucks, but they really insist that this is kept in parallel. That's why it's called a complementary currency. There is the conventional money, and there's complementary currency. Now, you're not going to be able to fill up your car with gas using uh, time dollars. That's not what it is designed for. It is designed to address local community issues. And it is very interesting in the case of time banking, uh, Edgar Kahn was able to get three rulings from the IRS to saying that anything earned in time dollars was tax exempt because it was a social purpose vehicle. Again, this is not true for all complementary currencies. If you're thinking of setting up a complementary currency, you need to talk to your tax authority and work something out. There are uh, cities, I think it's Bristol, is that right? Is it Bristol? Yeah. Bristol is, uh, has actually uh, is, uh, has their own Bristol pounds, and I believe they are tax exempt. And I know they're actually the mayor of Bristol is paying himself his entire salary using Bristol pounds. He is that committed to this complementary currency. <coughs> Hi. Oh, I just had a question about the transferability of the uh, time hours. Mm -hmm. 
They're not. So like, if I say I'm a retail owner for a local market, <coughs> and I have a kid who comes up, I can't give him, you know, his chocolate bar for a time base and then use a time base to get someone to take out the trash. No, because you most likely have to pay dollars in order to get those candy bars in. But if, I, but if it's if I'm gonna spend money on paying someone to take out my trash, then I just take that time dollar and then pay someone else. Yeah, yeah me, you, you can can't, you can't, it's mostly, it's mostly service oriented. In this particular design, it's mostly service oriented. There are other examples that are more commercial, such as Berkshires, for example. I don't know if you've heard of the Berkshires. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> They're designed to be commercial. This is purely social purpose to get people um, working. However, they can buy certain things, usually it's like uh, being able to go to the cinema and get a free ticket or a discounted ticket. So there may be a blended um, transaction. Right. Yeah, like if I was, you know, to give an example how it would work, this classroom needs to be painted. You're going to have to pay for the paint using dollars. My time can be paid for in a complementary currency such as time banking, time dollars then I can take those time dollars, I can get something else out of the community. I, I guess my specific question is, is the IRS regulation to prevent me as a store owner from selling stuff that are actual goods with time dollars? Is that for me to sell a kid a candy bar? I think it's your, again, we're getting into the space of an agreement. If you I, want I to take time dollars, if you want, no, the, the yeah, it's earning tax, uh, there is tax exempt. If you earn something in a time dollar, you're a tax exempt. You do not have to disclose that on your on your um, IRS forms that you file on April 15th. If you wish to choose to take uh, time dollars in payment for something, that's your business. But I don't think you'd be selling candy bars uh, for can for time dollars. Sorry, you still look. You, I haven't there's answered your question. Have like I? Nothing that stands in the way for me. But the way that I mean, obviously, time banks approach it is that it's not the the value of the candy bar; it's the time that went into preparing it for bringing. Yes, it's just kind of funny. But well, there needs to be there would have to be some rate of exchange to say, to say this time people's time worth X amount of dollars, and then for me to it not in time banking specifically that there is a, a very clear differentiation between yep. dollar value versus. Time right, so I guess I'm saying if you wanted to take that conversion into dollars, so then there would have to be some right. rate so of they, exchange. But they, they don't. They, they, don't. they, they say they don't. There is no rate of exchange. There is no rate of exchange. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mentioned it you know, in people's minds at time dollars worth 10 bucks, but it's not convertible. Is it? Because I've never, I've never heard that. I know with Ithaca Hours, it was Ithaca Hours, it was $10, but I've never heard about it. Yeah, I heard it. I heard it for time banking. And I may have gotten it confused, but yeah. Let's, yeah. Um, this is more time banking. One of the largest systems of time banking is, uh, is used for the uh, nur visiting nurses service in the five boroughs of New York. Highly successful. And I want to just very, very briefly talk to you about banking, because uh, this is something that is very near and dear to our hearts. Um, Almost 80, 80 years ago, um, in Germany, a group of seven businessmen would get together every week and just talk about business and how things were going. And this particular week, everybody's uh, face was in there, was down and very downtrodden because each of them had received a notice from their bank that either their line of credit had been cut or completely uh, re reversed. And they're looking around at each other and said, how are we going to pay the employees at the end of the week, at the end of the week, at the end of the month? And what they realized sitting around this table while drinking their beer is they used the currency, the then the, the mark, to pay one another for goods and services. That they were actually interacting with one another. And what they decided to do is to have a ledger of balance of, of debits and credits. So I would sell something to Mark, he would get a credit, and I, I would get a credit, he would get a debit. With his credits, he would get something from Margaret, and all the way around. So what happened was they realized that they were then able to get on with the business of running their businesses uh, by having what were they called a we which is uh, meaning we ourselves. 
And through this network of debits and credits, 80 years later, this is responsible for about 60% uh, of small to medium-sized businesses in Germany and in Switzerland. Um, it is, um, it is counter-cyclical. So when the ordinary banks are not lending, the Weir bank lends, and they lend out in Weirs. And one Weir is equivalent to one Swiss franc. And um, it is uh, non-convertible. Uh, you have to pay your taxes in uh, Swiss francs. Um, and it is hugely, it has been one of the big successes and is <coughs> considered one of the reasons why Switzerland, I said Germany at the beginning, but why Switzerland is so economically solid. It's not because it was neutral in the uh, First and Second World War or there's so many banks headquarters in Switzerland. It is actually de facto because they have this other currency that is counter cyclical. So when the times are rough and the banks are not lending, the weir can be used in its stead. Are you saying it was founded in Switzerland? It was. I said Germany at the beginning. I made a mistake. It was founded in Switzerland. Um, in closing, I would just want to tell you another um, idea that is in a pilot project in Lithuania, of all places. And <coughs> the Prime Minister of Lithuania, who happens to be a woman, said that she really wants her country, which is a small country, to be a learning country, and she wants to make sure that everybody is internet proficient. So they set up, uh, one thing you have to know is that they got the highest penetration of fiber optic cable in Europe, and everybody's got a mobile phone. So they set up a, an idea called the Dora Land uh, Economy, where everybody has what you call their dream bucket, their dream project, it may be to go to uh, Tibet and study uh, Buddhism. It may be come um, here to Baltimore. Uh, you know, whatever a, a young kid would like to do, they write up what their dream project would be, and they go to the Learning Foundation and they said, "If you can make my dream project come true, I am willing to teach English for a thousand hours, or I'm willing to teach piano, or I'm." You know, they give, they make a contract in lieu of for this uh, dream coming true for me, I will do X, Y, and Z. So there's a flow between the, uh, the citizen and the actual foundation itself. And the number of their account is the number of their, of their cell phone. And um, nonprofits uh, can actually get internships because people might say, oh, I want to join a particular nonprofit. I'm willing to give a thousand hours of work to a nonprofit uh, in lieu of my dream project being realized. So it's a way of nonprofits getting DORAs in order to pay their, uh, their employees. So this is some of the ways uh, you can actually learn, earn DORAs. Uh, one is internet proficiency. So a lot of younger people seem totally fluent with um, you know, devices and the internet. And if they teach people over the age of 40, they get DORAs, as does the person who is learning from the younger person. And I think one of my favorite aspects of this is um, kids under 12 are asked to go into their community and find an older person and ask them this very, very profound question. What is it in your life that you have learned that you feel I should know now as I grow up? And that opens up a very deep dialogue of wisdom between the older person and the younger person. And the young kid can either you know, make a film, write a, a sing a song, do an interpretive dance, whatever. And these are judged, and doors are given for this, and I think for the top uh, <clears throat> essays or the top uh, summaries of the wisdom that has been archived, there are very special programs. One of the things that we feel so much in our communities at the moment that we are divided. There's a big chasm not only between the races, there's a huge chasm between older people and younger people. And through this design of these types of currencies, 
people can come together in very, very meaningful ways. Um, it's important that we start looking at these alternatives because guess what? Uh, our whole system is in trouble. Whether you look at the top down, from the bottom up, left or right. And there's something that uh, hit me very succinctly when we were listening to the interview last night about uh, capitalism, in the belly of capitalism comes socialism. And really what I, if there's one thing I'd like you to take away from this, in the capitalist society and in the social and even communist societies, there has never been a re-evaluation of money. When there was the communist revolution in, in Russia in uh, 1918, they never looked at the money system. They still had the same money system. And it is now, I think, incumbent upon us, no matter where you are in a, on the political spectrum, to reevaluate money and know that it is it resides in the space of an agreement, and any agreement can be renegotiated, and new agreements can be formed. So we have to get out of this box of a debt-based uh, currency system with absolutely nothing backing it that has to remain uh, limited, not in sufficiency, in order for it to maintain its value. Um, this crisis, you know, this was not uh, written by some socialist magazine. That actually was from The Economist in September 2009. You know, our current money is absolutely worthless. We're running out of solutions. <coughs> and I think for this immaculate, wonderful gem of a, a planet to survive, if we have to look at our money system not only because the money system is, in, is not sustainable itself, and I think we've demonstrated that in our discussions around debt and other things, but the earth itself, no matter what we try to do in terms of uh, emissions and uh, uh, grassland restoration and renewable energy, we can do all that, and that's great, but our money system is also killing our planet and um, we are running out of time. And I'd like to thank you for your time. Structure the, the last part of this. Did you want to just have question and answer or go into breakout? Okay. 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 Great. Yeah. Are you going to get up there? Yeah. Yeah. But you want to say something about it? Yeah. Quickly. Because someone asked about that. I'm sure. Good morning. I'm Scott Morris. I live in New York. It has a very famous local currency model called the Hours. It was created in 1991 by a guy by the name. Paul Glover, who now lives in Philadelphia. Um, I, I would normally have hours in my stack here, uh, but I gave them all to uh, my graphic designer to help me do a new currency program there. So uh, the IFC hours got really famous because they were a cash system. They kind of were moving into the time space where time banking is, trying to have a currency that was associated to the, the, the time value of the labor of, of the hour of labor. Um, and that ended up causing some problems because they had to, you know, you don't, when you go and pay for your coffee, the guy who's on the other end of that doesn't really want to have this philosophical discussion about the value of your hour's labor, but he just wants to keep the change and move on to the next customer. So they said, okay, one hour is $10. Um, and that ended up hurting it because $10 in 1991 is $17.41 here in 2014. So the cost of bit of a disparity there. So um, the lost Paul, he handed it to an organization and they didn't really have a, a business plan that, you know, a, a membership network that could afford an organizer. And he put so many volunteer hours into it that it eventually just kind of fell by the wayside. So I moved, to, again, not knowing the status of that system and just being a currency nerd who reads books like Jackie's and just really, really loves them. Uh, but I found out the situation there and I'm, I'm moving forward with uh, another system that I'm calling Pit the Cash. And so that will be a cleaner 
currency thing not moving and not doing the whole time when you're seeing it. But if you're curious about that, come and find me later. Thanks, Scott. So, you know, it's very nice to see this evolution of local currencies happening because I think ours was one of the earliest modern local currencies. Of course, there were many in the wake of the Great Depression because people just didn't have money. I mean, these systems were started to put people uh, put money in people's hands so they could actually go around and do the things that they needed in their daily lives. And the hours um, coming from the early 90s was one of the first modern ones and ones that we looked at um, starting the B note. So Baltimore has a local currency. I don't know how many of you, how many of you know that Baltimore has a local currency, I should ask. Okay, almost all of you, that's good. Well, I, I just passed them around. <laughs> <That's what laughs> so if you examined the notes with Frederick Douglass, you will notice that that is Baltimore's local currency, you know. Um, and so I, I have to give credit to all the other presenters because this is it's a lot of the background that I usually go into when I talk about where this whole effort started, which was, you know, and I will get to the details of the Beano, but I want to just do a very quick overview because it, you know, it came out of the whole economic crisis and starting to look at what the fundamental problems were with the United States economic system and the fact that money is all created out of debt, that the interest is not created when they create the loan, which I was going to make that point very strongly because that sets us against each other, fighting each other for scarce resources to pay back this interest as well as the principal. And so we looked at all these things that were happening in the wake of the financial crisis and we said, well, you know, the central issue is the dynamics of the money system. How can we start to create something that doesn't fight what's currently going on, although you know, providing active resistance is one really good way of doing it and not you know, paying the legitimate loans is wonderful. Um, concomitant with that, can we start something that just has positive dynamics? If there's this huge, dark, death star of a financial system that's sucking the life out of everybody <laughs> over here, can we create this little positive point of light and say, hey, everybody over there, look, look at us over here. Bring your energy and your time and your interest and your use of money into this little point of light and make it so much bigger than it is now with all positive dynamics, supporting communities, supporting small business, supporting us, supporting people. Because what do we really want out of all this? We want a balance. We want to create value for our communities and for our people because we all need to be you know, creating value for people. It's, it's, it's our self-worth, it's what we do in society. But then at the same time, we need to balance the time that we spend creating value with living, with being human, with creating art, and, and living and loving and appreciating music and you know, uh, just having a good life, having a better life and not being chained to a desk, chained to a cubicle somewhere, creating value for corporate masters just because that's the way it is. You know, that's not the way it is. That's the way it was constructed, so that they can extract value from everybody. And that was all in service of the profit market. So, having said that, <laughs> um, we were looking at the financial collapse and the fact that profit drives all these financial decisions. Um, we were looking at the fact that finance and banking as a percentage of our corporate um, landscape here in the U.S. has doubled or more than doubled, and these are not productive enterprises. These are enterprises that take money and try to make more money, and it's become a, you know, a quarter of our entire economy without us really paying attention. And this is only celebrated in the media when you see cover stories, you know, glorifying the Wall Street excesses, um, time, news, good, whatever. Um, so we've grown up with this over the last few decades, this glorification of profit. And we need to get back now to a balanced, a real productive enterprise, to going out and doing real things in real communities for real people, and having it make a difference, and connecting these points so that the value flow is within our communities and within our cities for our own benefit, and not for the benefit of the banks, not for the benefit of the corporations, and not out of a profit motive. Although profit, you know, profit is obviously an important part of business, you need a profit to feed your family, but an excessive focus on profit is unhealthy. And that's, you know, that's why the quote is not the money is, money is the root of all evil, it's the love of money is the root of all evil. That is the quote, and that's the actual quote. You can focus on money as, in and of itself, and not a, you know, as an end, and not as a means to an end. It's just wrong, and unhealthy. So, 
So, I'm trying to read my notes because I was jotting down things to say. I should have brought a, a wonderful PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> but, um, so, we need to resist, but we also need to create this point of light to draw energy off the existing system. So what did we do? We started getting out there in the communities and we started talking to business owners and saying, we're going to create this local currency. We didn't say, you know, we're thinking of creating a local currency, or maybe we'll have a local currency, or what do you think about a local currency? We said, we're creating a local currency. We're going to make this local currency, and it's going to be in circulation next spring. This was in late 2010. It went into circulation in uh, April 2011. We said, we're going to have a local currency. It's Baltimore's local currency. Will you accept it? And, you know, for every three or four business owners we went into their place, one would say yes. So we started aggregating this business network that would already accept the B-notes when they hit the streets. We didn't even have a design yet. We just knew we were doing this. We knew this is what we needed to do in Baltimore to start democratizing the economy and to start leveling the playing field. So we got 55 businesses together before launch to say, yes, we will accept the B-note, we will accept Baltimore's local currency. Uh, we had a design contest in the meantime, and we got some wonderful entries. I'm gonna pass these around. You've already seen the one, but the five has Poe on it, uh, Raven on the back. And this, this sort of happened almost by accident. Our designer put Dashiell Hammett on the five. It's a little bit of Beano trivia. Um, and we took it to a meeting and we said, you know, I was like, I, I knew Dashiell Hammett. He wrote uh, you know, uh, detective stories. And you know, one of the people in there was like, who's Dashiell Hammett? I don't think we should do this. <laughs> I was like, well, he's blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, I know. I can go to Wikipedia and find out. But who is he, really? I mean, he's great, but let's put someone on there that people will really, right off the bat, identify with Baltimore. So, you know, as Jackie mentioned, it's taking these local figures using Frederick Douglass on the one, and the reason I put Frederick Douglass on the one was there are 50,000 ones that we printed, and I wanted to get as many Frederick Douglasses in the circulation as possible. We printed 12,000 fives with Poe. Um, and then it just happened that the Oriole and Raven ended up on the back. Just sort of a, a happy, happy coincidence, but it all fell into place. Um, and throwing it out there as a design contest was the right thing to do because we didn't want to, you know, sit around trying to design a bill. We didn't have background in designing currency, and what we would have come up with is far short of what Richard Winchell, who was our eventual uh, design contest winner, came up with. They're just beautiful, and the designs and their beauty have gotten us so far, so much farther than we ever could have gotten. You know, trying to just put stuff down on paper and draw it ourselves. And the power of a local currency being paper, I'm going to just touch on because Jackie mentioned that, um, people get it in their hands. It's visceral. You know, it's something that you're so familiar with the dollar that people don't think about, you know, oh, yeah, it's money. I take it out and spend it, whatever. They pull it out of their wallet. They do the whole ritual. But when they get a B-note in their hand, it makes them stop, and it makes them look at it and say, oh, my God, what is this? What is it again? You know, you can explain it, and people still don't get it. And it takes a few um, explanations before they, it starts to sink in. What is, oh, it's real money. Oh, I get it, it's money. You know, they've had it in their hand for a minute and they're finally just getting it. You know, oh, I spend it. You know, they'll ask, what do I do with it? It's my money. Shut up, get some stuff, get some coffee, whatever. Um, it starts to sink in. Oh, yeah, okay. And, and by having it in physical form, it is an emblem of this is ours, this is the people's, this belongs to us, it belongs to everybody in this room, everybody in this city, and we created it and we can use it and give it whatever dynamics we want. And so, how is that important? You know, what are the dynamics of the Beano versus the dollar? So, we're never taught this in school. Again, you know, we don't get economics training. I remember being in high school and, and taking home economics, which was basically um, how to write a check. You know, you learn how to do basic budgeting and how to write a check for your uh, electric bill. Um, but the dynamics of the dollar, you know, it's completely neutral. And some people, especially libertarians, will say that that's an awesome thing. You can take a dollar anywhere and get anything you want with a dollar. Well, yeah, okay. That's one positive benefit to the dollar. But there are so many other things that it does not create. So it creates a a love of dollars, basically. The dollars become, as I said, an end in and of themselves. Um, they do not have anything that benefits people specifically, that benefits communities, that benefits really anything, any one thing over another thing. So they become an end in itself. 
in themselves. And to pile up dollars becomes this wonderful thing. Yo, oh, I've got Scrooge McDuck. I can swim in a, a sea of dollars, and, and you know, it's great. Um, so that's yeah, the prevailing notion. B notes turn that on its head. Because a B note has to be taken to a local business. We started with 55 local businesses all across the city that were accepting B notes when we launched. Now we've got over 215. So we've about quadrupled the size of the business network in three years. Um, over 200 businesses across the city, and I've got directories downstairs that you can pick up. Um, there are brochures that we've designed that you can pick up. I'll pass these around as well that explain a little bit more about the dynamics of the system. But to be able to take this, these B notes to 220 businesses and get coffee, and go to Bell Hardware and get a hammer, to go to Golden West and buy dinner, to go to Breathe Books and buy books, um, this is powerful. This is where people start to say, oh, wait a minute, okay, there are ways that I can use my money that actually benefit, in the end, me. It comes back to me. Because spending money at a local business, three times as much money stays in the local economy. They buy more from other local businesses, they give to local nonprofits, they support local community efforts, they support us because we are in their community, and in turn, we support them. We go to their business. It's a, it's a virtuous cycle of business. Did you have a question? Yeah. Over 215. Over 215. Yes. Okay. Uh, any of them within the low-income communities or the? Uh, yes, that's a very good question. I'm going to I'm going to get to that exact okay. issue because I know that's a very big theme this weekend. Um, and it's something we're trying to address because our entire purpose was to level the economic playing field for all of the city, the entire city of Baltimore. Okay. Um, so. So those are the basic dynamics. You know, encourage people to think about who they're supporting when they go out and spend their money every day. They choose to support local businesses. The businesses have it in their hands, have it in their registers. They're thinking about, how can I use these B notes as a dollar instead of cashing them back in and trading them back in for federal dollars? Who can I go to to use them? So Golden West is going to use them at Zeke's for coffee. You know, Bell Hardware, they're going to take it in. They're going to go out to eat you know, at Tapas Teatro or something that accepts B notes. Um, these are the fundamental flows that start to alter the landscape. And this is what starts to get to your point, which I'll also touch on later, but the most important thing is that we alter the money flow because we all create value doing everything we do every day. And it's so important to put that value back into our local communities and buy local, but then on top of that, by using local currency, ensure that that value stays in our local communities. And over time, if we're pouring our value into our local communities and more of it is staying there, that's where it gets powerful. And that's where we have the wealth building effect that people talk about in relationship to local currencies. That we wouldn't be talking about closing rec centers in Baltimore. We wouldn't be talking about opening gambling places. We would have all the wealth we need in this city to do everything we want to do as citizens, as residents, in our communities, build parks, whatever, all these examples that you've seen, that can happen in Baltimore by putting the value back into Baltimore and into our communities. So that's, in a large sense, what we are trying to foster with this local currency. Yeah? Are there ways you're looking for people to get involved? Absolutely. Um, we are looking, we're always looking for volunteers. And we have a lot of outreach that needs to be done. We need people to contact businesses in all communities across the city, especially minority-owned businesses, um, and try to make inroads with communities that we have not been circulating in. We, we find that that would be a great strength. When we're circulating across the city, and we can just go anywhere in Baltimore and use a B notes for something, that's a great thing. And I, just want, I do want to add that uh, businesses are in control of this. It's our currency. Business owners are, are citizens as well, and residents. And business owners can choose to accept as many or few B-notes as is comfortable for them. So a lot of restaurants will say, we accept up to 20% of the bill in B-notes because that's what they can comfortably handle. And that's fine, that's their choice. Some places take 50%, Breathe Books takes 50% in B-notes because she, you know, she orders a lot of her books from out of state, she has to you know, have a fair number of dollars to pay for that at this point. But as the system grows, as there are more places to use them, the restaurants and other businesses can increase those percentages and they can then say 50% or we take 100% in units. Yeah. Um, does Barnes and Noble or Starbucks take peanuts? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
That's a good question. These, so these are some of the things that we've had to deal with over the years, is, is um, thinking about the dynamics of you know, Barnes & Noble or Walmart, you know, suddenly deciding, oh yeah, we're gonna accept a few notes. Well, the way we designed it is to look at the dynamics of all the other local systems that were in place, Ithaca Hours, Berkshires, the Lewis Pound, the Bristol Pound, Brixton Pound. Um, and so we've got a 10% discount on buy-in, so people exchange dollars for V-notes, exchange $10 for 11 V-notes, $20 for 22 V-notes, you spend it just like $22. So you get a 10% bump. Well, the business owner, when they take it in, they've got a number of things they can do. They can pay employees in V-notes, they can use it for supplies, services, they can give it as change to help it circulate. If they can't, if they don't find a way of circulating all of their V-notes, yes, they can get dollars back for them. 11 V-notes goes back to $10 to balance that initial discount. So when you start talking about corporations like Walmart or Barnes & Noble, they're never gonna take a 10% discount on any money. So if they were to take in V-notes and decide, well, we're just gonna take them in and get dollars for them, they would never take that 10% hit. And it's designed so that local businesses can easily accept as many as they can use, never have to pay the 10%, ideally, um, but corporate chains will never do it. And it, so that's sort of all, almost a, an elegant built-in dynamic that, that fends off corporate use of local currency, which is nice. Um, Did you have a question? Okay, so, um, so obviously we're in support of all these other systems. We're in support of time banks. I love the Japanese credit hours. We are very strongly in support of public banking, and I actually spoke in Annapolis in favor of a public banking study bill, which we need to get pushed forward so that we can actually have uh, banking institutions that benefit us. But in the meantime, our idea was to take the backing fund, because all of the dollars exchanged for B-notes, there are about 35,000 B-notes out there now on the street, um, that have been exchanged, so we've got about 32, $32,000 in the bank. We put it in a small local bank, the Tapsco Bank, our idea is to take that backing fund and make microloans on the other side. So the B notes out there, 35,000 plus B notes doing their work in the business community and in the, in the communities to inspire people and make them buy local and foster these positive dynamics. On the other side, we can take the backing fund and make microloans to small businesses, you know, at no interest, with maybe a small administrative fee for expansion to entrepreneurs to fill in gaps in the supply chain locally. So that we end up with vibrant, connected, local supply chains that are serving everybody's needs. And it doubles the power of the money because it's circulating, but then we can also have it out there working for us, for the communities, yeah. Yeah, I'm curious about two things. One is, um, I spend most of my time and money locally. I don't see the places that accept B-notes particularly advertising, or I mean, you gotta ask mm -hmm. to figure it out. And second is, uh, it's not obvious where you get, where you can buy mm -hmm. B notes. Yes, so that is an awesome segue because that, that leads right to our challenges. And the challenges that we're facing right now, even having gotten out there and having printed this thing, we have ones and fives, we're looking to print tens and twenties this year with Baltimore women on them, because we've already got two guys. Um, prominent Baltimore women on the tens and twenties. Um, our challenges primarily are um, recognition. It, this, this is a thing, and we've been trying to get as much press as we can, get on the radio, get marketing materials to businesses, which all takes many volunteer hours, it takes design hours, it takes money to print it, um, print these promotional materials. Um, these are some of the challenges that we face, and they're very serious challenges because we're an all-volunteer group, so we're always looking for new volunteers to come in and do some of these things, whether it's calling a couple of businesses and just saying, hey, how it's going, do you, how's it going, do you need more materials? Or calling new businesses to say, this is a thing, would you like to accept B-Nuts? You know, especially in areas that we're trying to shore up or get into. Does that answer your question? The part of where can I get B-Notes? Okay, so 11 of our 215 plus businesses are Cambios, our money exchange locations. We adopted the European term Cambio. Um, it has a little cachet to it. Um, and those 11 are actually listed in the brochure uh, right at the bottom here. 
It explains where you can get them. So Zeke's Coffee, uh, Women's Industrial Exchange, Rooftop Pop, which is a new local market out in Highland Town. Um, there are 11 cambias now. And we're hoping that now in the future, we're sort of at a little bit of a plateau as far as business adoption, simply because of the manpower and woman power to get out there on the street and explain that this is happening and that people should be adopting it in their business. Yes? Well, I'm from the community and I'm at the grassroots level. How can we get a, do you have any grassroots businesses or communities involved with people? Because what you're saying, mm -hmm. for me, in my community, it has to be an education. It has to be some type of awareness. Absolutely. And starting at the grassroots level and getting people to understand, do you have some, I know you want to get into community, but mm -hmm. answering that part of the question. Sure. And so we do a lot of going out to community organizations and doing presentations and answering questions mm -hmm. to try to give people a little bit of a taste of what local currency is and why it's important and how it benefits us as residents and benefits our communities first. Um, and I'd love to come out, or, or one of our you know, volunteers can come out and explain the materials. Um, we've gone to business meetings, uh, Baltimore Main Streets on uh, Green Mount Avenue it was one that we went to um, in Lower Waverly, I guess it is, around 30th, 31st Street. And you know, try to get an exposure for these business owners. This is happening in their city, and this is important. Okay. A lot of easy questions today. I'm going to ask no more questions. Okay. okay. All right. I'm ready. If, yeah, because you've been asking about the grassroots and the low income communities. Is there a way for those communities to get access to Beano resources mm -hmm. that are outside the scope of what the dollar system can offer? That's the question. Are there other resources other ways outside what the dollar system, system can offer? Right. Okay. What, what, how do how do B notes make local money more accessible for people who don't already have money? Yes, very very good question, and that's been one of our bigger challenges: is how to connect this thing called local currency. That in the in the first implementation, people have to exchange dollars for B notes. Well, what if you don't have dollars? How would you get value in this new system without having dollars first? And so. Um, I was actually I was talking with Edgar Kahn, and he was in. The, he, was, uh, he started time banking, and I uh, was sort of just throwing ideas around with him because I want to connect the two. I went to a time bank conference up in Providence a couple of years ago, and it struck me that the most powerful thing to do, because we are all the ones, humans are the only ones creating value in society. How do we create value and also have it funnel into our local economies without having to get hours back? You, know, you can spend an hour in a time bank. But what if you don't need a massage or need your lawnmower fixed or need PC repair? What if you need a hammer to make more cabinets? Or what if you need to eat, you know, and want to go to a restaurant or an urban farm and buy something? Um, and then you need this paper currency to carry the value around. But how would you get that doing it with your labor? And it seems to me that if we can, if we can connect the two, if we can have people do hours at a time bank and somehow over a certain threshold, um, get local currency to take out to businesses, to stores, and spend. You know, you can't just do it one for one and say, oh, you can do all this labor and get all this currency, but you know, there has to be a, some kind of merit aspect to it where you've been involved with the time bank. You're, you know, like, uh, like eBay has, you know, you rate the sellers and you get a positive rating over time. If you're participating in a time bank and you're giving to your community and really putting yourself into this local system, then you should be able to get also local currency above a certain amount and take it out into your community and spend it. Mm -hmm. And some hardcore time bank people will say, no, 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 it's non-taxable. You know, this is something that, this is why we do hour for hour, because the IRS can't touch it. Well, I say, let a thousand flowers bloom. Let there be a whole other dynamic to time banking. Let some of that value flow into local currency to make that connection between people doing the things that they want to do and providing value and being able to go to stores and restaurants and get what they need. And this seems critical to me. Yeah. So I have a question. I think it's maybe more for Jackie and some people from other cities. I mean, I, the B note is such a great idea conceptually, but it seems, you know, it's like you guys keep hitting up against walls, and there are all these challenges. And I, when you talk, Jackie, it, it has an air almost, you know, that it's easier. And I just wonder, if, like, if, if there are best practices <coughs> in other cities, or what Baltimore can learn from from the world. I, it's not easy. 
I, I, we, and I we're doing a disservice by saying that it is easy. I'm, I'm not saying it is impossible. There are challenges. And I think you know, everybody here that's involved in complementary currencies, they keep on coming up against certain barriers. So that's part of the learning process. And as I said last night, it's like early aviation. It's a miracle that some of these things fly, but they do. And as we perfect these and uh, come up, I think mostly the issue is of governance, you know, how, how to deal with difficulties that come up in a community. And as we get more and more mature and have a body of information that we share among one another, I think you will see the submarine set flying. So yes, there's an awful lot of hard work that goes into these, and they do work. And again, it, it's more mature in Europe and in South America. So it's, you're, you're starting to work baby steps. And you I just are wonder if there are particular communities that we can learn from, or yeah. certain <coughs> that makes sense for well Lamar. Yes, um, there's a book downstairs. Uh, so I'm, <laughs> to, I'm not sure trying to plug you my should, book. You should buy Jack's book. <laughs> but you know, it, goes, it, goes, it, goes, it talks about really ordinary people, communities that come together and have found solutions for what <coughs> they need to do to link unused resources with fund that needs. And that hopefully will inspire you to come up with something different and more aligned to what we're trying to do going forward. And I think that's something. exactly where we need to go here, because yeah. that's what's going to connect it to all of the communities in the city. How can each community adopt local currency to do what it needs to do? Right. And those are some of the fundamental things that we may need help figuring out how to get out there and publicize that and make it a reality. Right. So we only have about 15 minutes left. and. Um, this conference, as we've been saying, is kind of a beginning. We need to have a next step from where we go. So I wanted to kind of, if I could get a sense from the room. We've heard about organizing around debt, um, and we've also heard about you know developing complementary currencies. Is there interest to go farther with one of these or with both of these? I kind of wanted to get a sense of where um, people are, because we're going to need to continue this discussion. Whatever we decide, we need to pick a path, or maybe two paths. There might be one contingent in the room that wants to take one path and one another. Yeah. I, I would, you, you do need to get rid of debt and need money. And there are people sitting right in Baltimore, people that want to get into businesses, like I have to buy a tech startup because uh, and I would be giving jobs. And there's other people that want to set the same software company. But they go to the banks, that's mm -hmm. like, you know, you gotta like jumping off a bridge, two bridges to get anything. So the next step is to get try to get money from VC or grant money. Um, there are people, the philanthropies, the foundation, if these new startups could get money, they could give jobs. And that would get rid of a lot of just debt, like student debt, people get more money, then they could pay student loans off. Uh, I mean, I, I have my student debt, oh, what am I gonna do when I get out of here, the jobs don't pay anything, or they're shipping jobs overseas, they're cutting the benefits, you know. I mean, you can't pay the debt off if you don't have the money. You give the startups some money, so I mean, maybe you, all could, you got connections to new foundations or philanthropies that give money to startups, companies, to, to give jobs. And then people can, you know, buy, go down to Whole Foods, buy some food, or say Whole Foods come somewhere else to a better of the, of the area that are not wealthy. You know, because the food, some of the supermarkets in the, the, the lower income areas, like you Baltimore, I mean, um, you're not exactly the best choice. So you, you better look closely at the red meat because, you know, uh, it, just, it's, it may not be organic. It maybe it's a higher level of bacteria. The smell is different. You know, it's, it's things you got to check. So I'm saying give the companies, the tech companies, the start, startup companies some funding, and then, you know, maybe you, all could, maybe you could work on getting help for new companies that want to give jobs, but if they're having trouble in this type of economy to get the money to do something. So that's one of, and that's a discussion we're going to continue having in the afternoon in the yeah. kind of alternative finance. Um, so oh. but there's a bunch of hands, so let's do one, two, three, four. So, um, For me, I think that both tracks are good, but I think it needs to be more intergenerational. And the one thing I'm enjoying about this conference is that there are a lot of people under, under 40 <laughs> in attendance because most of the time these discussions go on and on. Like, the money, the debt collector. I got your book last night, and I have a 25-year-old granddaughter living with me. I'm like, I put this for you to read so you can understand what your future's gonna look like. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> also, I want to tell you know when I go home, she said, "What are you going this morning, Grandma?" I'm like, "I'm going to this conference, and I'm gonna share with her about the money because in low-income communities, Baltimore just has, like they said last night, the two Baltimores. Right. 
your project and the money thing it's a whole separate and it's going to be take a big sell and impact the neighborhoods to get people to buy into it and to get people in low-income neighborhoods and challenged neighborhoods to understand you don't have to be tied to debt mm -hmm. you know it's a belief that oh, you can't get anything you're going to die in debt you know that's not true you know even though you're struggling to get out of but i just wish it would be more intergenerational you talk about going to communities you know, when you're out of town, but getting that whole conversation so you can understand that it's just not old people that are that, that young people, because they want more education, is going to be 100 by the time they pay off the student loan understanding the system. And very quickly, one connection with the lower income communities that we sort of brainstormed is starting corner stores that do have fresh produce. That can be bought from urban farms that take the you know, and start to get a money flow. I'm, a, I'm asking these questions because I'm going to. That changes talk. the money flow in low income neighborhoods and gets healthy food in there because food is so central to that. But I want to do it up within the store because there's a behavior of people mm -hmm. in the store that got If people go in the store, they don't understand mm -hmm. what happens with the corner store. Hopefully, it starts to change the culture. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pass around my notebook if you're interested in community currencies and you want to have an email list that's associated with that. Please sign up. Yeah, and please, we've got a sign up downstairs. Uh, we've got a table in the, in the yes. lobby with the, uh, along with the materials. We've got a sign up for the B note. Okay. Uh, mailing Thank you. Uh, sorry, I was going to say that one of the things that I've noticed about this
types of money. We, we say that, and we know we're talking about it. Because we, 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 we have time banking, we have social purposes, social purpose currencies, barter currencies, mutual credit systems, this whole range, but it's just totally outside the normal vocabulary. So nobody really knows what's going on there. So we would, we would be happy to contribute into that so that we can you know, educate about the money piece of these. Um, and, but you know, combating the debt, I mean, I'm 80,000 in the home from my degrees. Right? 80,000. And I'm just like, I look at it, I'll laugh. I'm like, I'm like, I'm never pay it. So anyway, like, so I'm really yeah. thankful for your work. <laughs> I think that, that we're operating from the perspective of the dominant culture's blinders when we even talk about money and resources. Uh, for instance, Joyce, we talk about West Baltimore and it's defined as impoverished. Well, it's impoverished in terms of the dollars that the dominant culture circulates. It's not impoverished at all in terms of talent, uh, skill, it's impoverished in terms of opportunities to engage those talents. It's a wash in resources and talent. Somehow we've got to, you know, time dollars is one possible way, but I think we've got to be more creative and figure out ways to connect the talent and create opportunities that those talents can, can be used. And institutions like this one, uh, but it's not the only one, you know, academic institutions, government, reinforce that perception uh, that it's either money or it's degrees. Yeah. Those are the only resources. Yeah. Anything else doesn't count. Frankly, you can't get anything done unless you use all the other resources too, mm -hmm. but we haven't put it together yet. You were, you were next. Oh, um, well there's sort of two things I was interested in learning more about. One was sort of this point around the creation of money, this whole thing around interest and how that's not being accounted for in the creation of money. I just, I understand what that means, but like I don't think about money in this sort of like fixed kind of way, so I just want to understand better the implications of what, what that's about and what the alternatives are on non-interest or, or money systems that account for the interest. If, if it all, I just, so I, I thought that was interesting. I would love to, since two people seem to think that was important, I would love to hear more about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the particular thing you're talking about is this link between, this is sort of the same thing I was trying to get at in the earlier question was, how do you take things like time hours, which is really a service thing that allows us to capitalize on the skills and talents that we have, even if we don't have capital and businesses to deploy them, and then for me to exchange those amongst each other, but then to be able to buy stuff that aren't services. So, and so, that sort of transitional thing you're talking about. And so one of the fascinating things, and this is something we'll get into this afternoon, is that it's possible to have multi a multiple currency universe. Right. Uh, so we, we, we keep on thinking, and we just need one type of money. Is it no? We can have an educational currency. We can have a time back currency. We can have you know, un no, several different currency. types of currencies, and you all have it on a smart, you know, on, on your smartphone or a card or something. And all this technology is now available. So would you say, I mean, I have to, I'm speaking on panel in the next session, so I can't be in the group, but uh, maybe is that all you know talk? Talk? <laughs> Maybe at lunchtime you can lunchtime. 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 talk about that a little bit more. And then you have a, um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Name. <laughs> did you have a question? Yes, I did. Um, what was the question? Oh, um, are you thinking maybe what was this? the president of uh, the dean from Sojourner or Red, Red Ellis for a place to start these courses or to be, I'm not it, sure we have a location. I think well, they definitely would need to be uh, well, I was in at, the community. Yeah, I was at um, um, Red Ellis and I picked up a, a whole piece of paper with all these classes on it. Right. And, uh, you know, I was looking at it. I'm not going to run down there in five minutes, but but that seems to be, they've already got it sort of a set up on, that's going. You wouldn't have to start from scratch. You might have your own places and your own offices. Um, food and Water Watch, <laughs> there's a room there for, you know, food. Uh, just what. So it sounds okay. like there's interest in, in continuing the conversation, and particularly in communities that are not being reached by opportunities um, and resources to start more kind of money literacy, debt, and what alternatives are, that mm -hmm. a concrete thing that's come up with this? That's not right, but you mentioned uh, what they're doing in Lithuania, Lithuania and Ireland. Uh, is there any way that um, three neighborhoods could get some uh, foreign investment, maybe <laughs> Spain, kind of, because, you know, the pol politics in this country is changing very quickly, my students are worried. Mm -hmm. You know, if something came out of the CC's benign, neglect certain areas, and like, you know, what you can do, blah, blah. 
maybe, you know, we could reach out to some foreign investment to actually do something. The government, uh, U.S. government is not, you know, yeah. not doing what they should be doing. Yeah. So Would there be interest in having Bank of Palmas come to Baltimore? I want to know also, maybe we can discuss later in the afternoon about the sustainability of this program. How long do, do they last? For example, I heard a lot about the ISACA program here in the United States, and I thought that was a very successful case. Mm -hmm. But when you said now maybe it's not as successful as I thought at the beginning, I know from here, from Spain. Um, you were mentioned that the con convertibility of, of the V notes in dollars is now like a the capital that you are putting in circulation is like a forty thousand, fifty thousand uh, dollars. Maybe for a city like Baltimore, one should think about maybe more than hundred, two hundred thousand. But it's still there, are a small amount. Uh, some of the restaurants, and bookstores are uh, changing. As uh, you said, they are accepting like a percentage, ten percent, fifteen percent. None of those are changing so far or accepting hundred percent of the purchase in, in Pinot. Then. Maybe we are still talking uh, about very small cases, and I don't know if there's any community, any experience in, <coughs> in a country which is really successful, uh, the whole community, the whole city, or even a small community has, is accepting and is exchanging these, these yeah. new currencies. Yeah. And, yeah. and maybe we are pull, putting all the emphasis in the, in the money. Uh, this workshop is about that, but yeah. it, it might. I would say that the 30% of the population now is still in the world are, are living without currency, with, with the, just exchanging services and, and, and goods and products, like agricultural products, without using any kind of currency. And, and they, are, they are living in, in good condition, I would say. Sure. My experience that traveling yeah, Africa is clear. We saw the currency as a way to change people's minds mm -hmm. using the system that was already in place yeah. that people under, understand or at least mm -hmm. use every day. You know, ah. To jack into that and use its power to make people think about what's going on. Right, right. And, and four out of five businesses do take 100% notes mm -hmm. for, for the sales, but yeah, it's still goods and services. And, and, and the, last, the last issue that I would like to, to leave here is about evaluation. Do we know, do we have some indicators of the, the improvement in the life of the people, if they are getting better? I don't, I'm not gonna, say if they are being wealthier or are being richer, but, but at least they, they, in their well-being or, do we have some indicators in which we know that these people are improving the quality of life? Yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah there's qualitative, there's qualitative um, surveys done in Germany mm -hmm. with the uh, with the Keengauer and with the whole Regio movement. Mm -hmm. They have done, the, but we're again in very early days here. I mean, unfortunately with time banking, although it's been around for 25 plus years, it's still, it's just, it's still very, it's still very, very marginal. Right. But Curitiba elevated yeah. their standard of living. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the things I forgot to mention, the Curitiba story, um, the residents of Curitiba had a standard of living one third higher than other people living in other parts of Brazil by using their local community currency. Right. Stephanie, you want to Over time. So quickly. The things, like I keep thinking in my mind about Baltimore, so I'd be curious to really learn too how other cities fund this. Like it sounds great, you know, to get out to the community and educate and do all this, but how do we even get the resources to do that? And then I also would love to learn in terms of Baltimore, you know, not only hearing about the money, but then how is that connected and how to sort of the other things we're talking about today, so cooperatives and land trusts and examples of models where that ties into the other. Okay, great. So these are some of the things that we'll bring up this afternoon when we do our, um, our final discussion and, um, and then out of that, we'll so, Great, so thank you everyone.